FOMO. The name of the game, you know, the the underlying principle to have an efficient company or team is you need to shift the mindset from optimizing to transfer information fast to flipping it on its head and optimizing to retrieve information fast. I'm Patrick J. McGinnis, and I coined the term FOMO. That's short for fear of missing out. And it's why some people end up following the crowd when they should be blazing a trail of their own. But if you want to achieve greatness in business and life, you've got to break free. Come on, I'll show you how. This is FOMO Sapiens, where we explore how entrepreneurial thinkers find the inspiration and the courage to build exceptional lives. Welcome back to FOMO Sapiens, the show for entrepreneurial thinkers. I'm your host, Patrick J. McGinnis. And today, we're talking to Nick Sonnenberg, the author of the book, Come Up For Air. And the reason why we're doing that is because if you're gonna take bigger swings, you have to be productive. (laughs) And believe me, I've been feeling busy. I don't know about you guys, 2024 just feels like a lot. And I was talking to Nick the other day because... Not only is he a guest on FOMO Sapiens, but we're also friends. And he was giving me advice on the basics like Inbox Zero, other things. So he's just an expert on how to get things done and how to use tools, productivity tools, in a smart way to advance your objectives. Now, Nick is an entrepreneur, a Wall Street Journal bestselling author, an ink columnist, and guest lecturer at Columbia University. He runs a company called Leverage, and before he did that, he spent eight years working as a high-frequency trader on Wall Street, where he developed a love and obsession for efficiency. So it's not a joke. The guy loves efficiency. Everything he does is more efficient than me, and I have been taking notes. Now, if you're curious about this book, Come Up For Air, which we will be talking about, and you're listening to this in March of 2024, head on over to com slash FOMO, where you can get the book for just 99 cents. That is com slash FOMO. All right, that's my little commercial. Now, as you know, we like to start every interview with the same question, so I started our conversation by asking Nick, this. Tell me something unexpected you learned about yourself that changed everything. I was always good at at math as a kid, but it wasn't Mm -hmm. really until high school and I started like competing in math tournaments and doing well. And my math teacher said like, hey, you ought to do this in college. Like I never, I kind of just enjoyed it, but I never really took it seriously. And, Mm -hmm. um, and in 11th grade, I got second place in California in this math competition. And like, that was really like an eye opening where it's like, huh, maybe I am like decent at this. And like, maybe I should take some classes in college. And, um, you know, because of that and this teacher that I had, it impacted my first year taking some math courses, which then made me change from being a biz econ major to a math major. And then I went on to do financial engineering, high frequency trading, et cetera. But a lot of it was was sparked really in 11th grade, having this kind of realization that I had this kind of gift in in math. That's a pretty good one. I wish I was good at math. <laughs> Unfortunately, I am not. One trick pony. Well, I'm good at addition and subtraction. So. Yeah, it's, you know, some of that's hard, and especially like that long division stuff. That can be, that can be tricky. <laughs> exactly. Too bad it didn't get me to high frequency training, but it did get me to this podcast today with you. And we're talking about your work, which is, you know, I'm going to I'm going to call it time management or productivity management. I don't know. Does that feel right to you? I mean, it's in that space. Um, Most of the time when you think about productivity, time management, you're thinking really about the individual and you're thinking more of those traditional strategies like time box or Pomodoro technique or, I don't know, morning routines or batching, like a lot of those things that you would hear in like the four hour work week or more so in like getting things done by t- by David Allen. Yeah. What I'm more focused on is team productivity where individual productivity is necessary but not sufficient for a team to be productive. It requires collaboration, coordination, and sometimes you actually have to sacrifice your own productivity for the greater good of the team. So yes, it's all about time management and these are all kind of precursors to it, but I'm much more in the space of how can an entire organization or an entire team be more efficient? It's very timely. I was thinking about it as I was reading through your, <laughs> No your pun book. intended. Right. Come up for <laughs> air. 
uh, your book. And I was because, you know, I, I think of myself in, in some ways as like an individual, you know, I sort of have my own thing. But I also I have like this a lot of people that I work with that help me make the show, for example, that are folks that I work with. They're not full timers, per se. They work in different aspects, but we, you know, we are a team and we've, I've set up these, these processes that are now automated. So I don't think about it. And it's just like, when I show up today and log into this, um, podcasting software, like you're, you're there because I set that up two years ago, stuff like that. So as I was reading through the book, I was thinking, actually, I do a ton of teamwork. I just don't think about it that way. But before we get into the, this sort of the entire system and, and mindset that you've 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 come up with. Let's just talk a little bit about the topic itself, because obviously, like this has been something people have been focusing on for many many years. It is not a new topic, probably ever since the advent of the industrial revolution, and yet we we haven't cracked it. So, why do you think that is? Uh, there's a couple. There's a couple of things. One, it's an extremely hard problem to crack. Two. Um, like take your example you just used with your podcast process, right? You invested the time, just like you, a lot of this stuff, it's an investment and you get a return, instead of a return on investment, you get a return on time. So just like you can invest money in the stock market or in, in real estate and then that $1 turns into maybe $2 over a period of time. It's the same with time. You can invest an hour two years ago setting up this process and you maybe have saved a thousand hours over a two year period, right? But in the moment when you're working on that process or you're trying to automate something or optimize something, it's not generating immediate dollars in your bank account. You know, there's like this invisible asset that's being created that's hard to value, right? You know that there's value there. But I think as humans, when you kind of have the opportunity to have an immediate benefit, Right, that that um, you know, you you consult and you make X thousand dollars for an hour doing a you know a talk or something. There's an immediate feedback loop and an immediate benefit that's visible versus you know, hey, I optimized this one step of this process using an automation tool like Zapier, and now I'm saving a minute every podcast. Over time, that's going to yield far more in your pocket, but it's not as visible in the moment, you know? And so it's a it's a trade-off. You definitely want to be you you definitely need money in the short term and you want to be saying yes to those opportunities, but oftentimes I think as humans it's kind of like 100% short term, 0% on this long term less visible thing. And I think that that's the big mistake and why people haven't haven't cracked it and I think that you need to make a trade-off and maybe it's not 50-50, but maybe it's 80-20, like take that short term money but still Invest in like your long-term foundation into some of this invisible stuff that's going to give you that ROT down the road. Um, so I think that, I think it's just complicated, you know, like individual productivity, it's complicated in itself, but it's exponentially harder to get a team of people to be coordinated and acting in a certain way. And then the third thing is tools have changed drastically like this stuff is like a moving target in the last just think in the last 10 years alone you've got slack asana coda notion monday clickup zapier like there's a million tools and so you've you're running your company and you know dealing with clients or product or whatever and it almost requires like a phd in tooling to keep up with all the stuff and that's kind of what i geek out on and that's you know, I've I've trying to shortcut the learning curve for people, so you don't have to go and spend four years in school to get a PhD in something. You know, that's why I wrote a book and, and developed a company around accelerating people's knowledge. Where you know, I've gone and done the heavy lifting of developing those best practices, and then allowing people to kind of benefit from those years of research, so they can get up and running qu more quickly with it. FOMO. FOMO. As you were talking, I was thinking about just my own career progression. And a lot of people who listen to this show started out in the corporate world and many are now, you know, they've gone into more, more agile or smaller companies or maybe they're entrepreneurs. And I remember, you know, I worked in investment banking. Like nobody used the word productivity with me because in fact, first of all, it was, the technology was completely different as you say. But number two was it didn't really matter. Nobody cared 
because they were happy if I just worked all the time. There was no interest in productivity as long as the the outcome was there. And if the outcome wasn't there, then they just, you know, they fired you. And so when you shift from that corporate world where there is a real, if you work all weekend and you're sending emails to your boss, there's a virtue signaling that I, oh, you know, I'm valuable. You should pay me more. Give me a bigger bonus. And then you shift into the world of entrepreneurship or working in startups or working, you know, in in a place that's not like that, you if you have the same mindset, you will crash and burn and you will fail because you can't, you know, your, your company's called Get Leverage. You can't leverage yourself. If you're a solopreneur and just grinding away is the only way that you know how to get things done, you're not going to succeed. So it is, it, it, it is a really interesting thing to think about. And then you add in all these tools. I was at a company, working with a company once. We started out with Asana, then we went to Notion, then we went to ClickUp, then it was, I mean, it was like yeah. just all, and I started, and I, as somebody who like hadn't used these, I was sort of like, well, this is so dumb. They're fine. They're all kind of the same. You know, I don't really care. Like, I'm going to have Nick tell me which one to use and let's just use it. But again, it, it, it is something that like my brain just can't process that kind of stuff. I'm not a nerd, but I don't care about that stuff. I need you to tell me how to do it. Let's get into your work because I just want to start kind of up here. Everybody who, if you can not see on video, I'm holding my hands up at 10,000 feet. What is the philosophy? If I was just to distill your approach into like a big picture yeah. mindset, what is it? So if I had to summarize, so the book is around 300 pages. If you have to distill it in a sentence, mm -hmm. um, the name of the game, you know, the, the underlying principle to have an efficient company or team is you need to shift the mindset from optimizing to transfer information fast to flipping it on its head and optimizing to retrieve information fast. So I'll say that again because it's it's subtle, but it's a, it's yeah, a really I, profound I, I, and distinct. I want to hear that so again. It, it, you want to be optimizing for speed of retrieval of information, not transfer, right? In other words, you want to be passing the baton, not the hot potato. So oftentimes, if you think about it, you're busy. After this podcast, you probably got a million other things you got to do. Right. Mm -hmm. So how easy is it for you just to shoot off a text to a team member like, hey, just wrapped up. Um, can you edit this by Thursday? Like that's super quick. Or maybe you prefer email, but maybe the editor prefers text. And then maybe your marketing person, you know, he or she likes to talk on Slack. And then some, you know, some people on the team, you know, they liked Notion, some like to sign, et cetera. Right. So everyone has their preferences. And then everyone selfishly, is optimizing for to do to just get it off their plate as fast as possible. Do that hot potato. So it's like, mm -hmm. hey, it's a quick text. I've done my part. Now it's on yeah, them. checklist. Right. Let me let it's, me do the checklist. And so by optimizing for, it's like in math. You have like local optimization and global optimization. If everyone's optimizing selfishly for him or herself, right, they save a second or two in the moment. But when everyone's mm -hmm. just trying to optimize and save shave off that few seconds to just get it off their plate, it's creating a scavenger hunt because now it's almost impossible to find what you're looking for, for that other person to find what they're looking for, or even frankly, for you to find it in a month. You know, you're trying to find, hey, what what was that thing I said to Nick a month ago? Was that in Slack, text, Asana, email, group Slack yes. message? Yep. You want to avoid all those things. So by optimizing and being short-sighted, for in that moment, the three seconds and not taking pause and putting it in the right drawer that it belongs, right? The three seconds you save might waste you 30 minutes in a month trying to look for it or your team member, right? And so if you align your team and everyone's aligned on what are all the drawers that we're using in this business and everyone's aligned around this concept of retrieval, optimizing for retrieval, and everyone understands these are the tools we use at company ABC, and this is the purpose, and we use this for this purpose, this for this purpose. They're like drawers. If everyone's willing to sacrifice the three, five seconds in the moment for themselves, what goes around comes around, and that's that's like the main difference of principle and philosophy that my book is about versus like a traditional productivity book. And you know, in, in your personal life, people already kind of think like this. I'll give you a few examples, but one would be, if you were just optimizing to be done with your laundry as fast as possible, you would take it out of the dryer and just throw it all in one drawer. That would be the fastest way to be done with laundry, right? But back to investing and spending, 
you invest your time, not spend, but you invest your time to separate socks in one drawer and underwear in another drawer. And you make that investment because you know that tomorrow when you need to get an outfit together, it's going to be much faster to put an outfit together, right? So that investment, that initial investment, it's not the fastest way to be done with laundry. It might take you an extra couple minutes, but now for the rest of the week, every day that you need to get an outfit together, you're saving time, right? So when you net it out and you kind of, you, you start off with like, say, two minutes behind for that investment, and then you add up all the time savings that you have, net you're, you're probably saving X minutes by doing that, right? And by keeping it organized. It's the same thing in business. You've got different drawers. You've got internal communication, external communication. You've got your personal communication. You have SOPs. You have processes. You have tasks. You have work that relates to projects. All of these items or units belong in a specific drawer. And if you have a different mental model of what that chest of drawers looks like compared to each of your team members, that's where chaos ensues. That's where the scavenger hunt happens. And if you could just figure out a way to avoid the scavenger hunt, and it's much less, I don't tell people, hey, the, you need to be on Asana, not Monday, or Monday, not click. Like The most important thing, they're all very good tools. We have our preferences and our partnerships. The most important thing, though, is that you align your team. You have a best-in-class one, and your team is aligned on when and how to use those tools. It reminds me of my first week in business school. We had this this game called Crimson Greetings. We did like day one or something. And um, and basically we were told we had to make like greet, as many greeting cards as we could in a certain amount of time. And we were put into groups and we didn't know anybody. And so like chaos ensued and, and there was no alignment. And the teams that did well were the ones that instead of rushing to make the cards, because they did it in rounds. So you sequentially like every time you would learn something and then you know, pivot as it were. Uh, we didn't say that back then, but now they do. Yeah. So anyway, the, the teams that did well were the ones where there wasn't somebody trying to yell at other people or tell people what to do. Instead, they sat back and thought strategically, what is a process that we can develop together and follow? And we're actually gonna do like some specialization of labor in there, but we're gonna have like a through way that we're all gonna agree with. And that of course was the big takeaway. So it sounds like, what you know, it, it is like you're, you're bringing that mindset into your work. I'm curious, Nick. You know, I've met you a couple of times, but I don't know the whole story. Productivity, like, why? Why are you the guy? Why is this what you've chosen to focus on? Is it something inherent with you? Like, what brought you to this work? Well, I've always been obsessed with time, like, even when I was a young kid. My mom's British and she's long-winded. So she would tell me a bedtime story and it would take like 10 times longer to tell the story. So I'd just be like, all right, I get it. She got eaten by yeah. some wolves and she liked to wear red. I, I'm going to go to bed now. <laughs> I don't know. I've just always been like squirrely like that. <laughs> it's um, so tender. <laughs> and um, I, I've always just felt, you know, time's our most precious asset. You could go bankrupt and lose your money and make it back. But, you know, every second you lose, you're never getting that back. And in college... Like kind of the first week I mapped out kind of what what um, general education classes would like double dip, triple dip, et cetera. So, you know, I was a kind of mapped that out and like very efficiently had a four day weekend and graduated in three years and, you know, did quite well uh, just because I was pretty strategic with how I approached it. So I've always been interested in that. I got into finance and uh, I did this particular type of trading called high frequency trading where it's all based off of algorithms and math that I develop and you'd code computers to trade stocks at nanosecond, microsecond kind of um, speeds. And in that space, literally a microsecond could be the difference of millions. So I really developed this muscle of like process automation, the value of time there. And then when I got into startups, I was my first my first app was a scheduling tool. Um, so I've always just been interested in saving time. After that, the early days of leverage, we were a freelancer marketplace because I wanted again to save time, not just for myself but for others, and be able to delegate and outsource kind of high level work and save time. And it. In that first iteration of leverage, we grew very, very quickly, bootstrapped to seven figures in the first year with 150 people on the team. But we made a ton of mistakes, and we were that's like the positive. On the negative under the hood, it was a complete 
shit show, if we can cuss a little bit here, but it yeah. was, um, you know, we were losing half a million a year with three quarters of a million dollars in debt. No one knew who I was because I was the behind the scenes guy and I had a business partner that was the front facing, but we were growing new clients like 20% a month, but we had like 10 to 15% of churn every month. So it was like good Ooh. marketing, masking. Yeah. You know, we were just kicking the can. It was like good marketing, masking a broken product. And yeah. one day I was having a coffee with my business partner and he just taps me on the shoulder. And again, he was the face of the company. People knew him, not me. He was what was driving the new clients in. And he taps me on the shoulder. I'm having my coffee and he says, he's out. Not in two weeks or two days. He's out in like two minutes. And so in that moment, I'm like, obviously I'm going white holding my coffee and I'm thinking to myself, holy crap, we're probably going to go bankrupt here. And I had to think, do I, do I stick it out or do I uh, walk away? And I decided to stick it out because I, 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 I felt like I could turn it around. The only limitation really I felt was with enough time, I could solve the problems. It's always, you know, if, if, if you have infinite time, you could pretty, pretty much solve any problem. It's the most valuable asset in my opinion. And, but it was tough, like, man, in like three months, we lose like 40% of revenue clients, team members. I'm cashing out my 401k. One day I'm driving with my dad to the bank. He's taking out a second mortgage on the house to help me make payroll. I mean, it was, it was tough. And I was, you know, actually working even more than the finance hours during this time. You know, we were talking about, you know, in finance, you know, they just, you know, you're working an 80, 100 hour a week. Yeah, I mean, this works. was like, this was like back to like, 100 plus hour weeks. And it's tough when you have like a house burning, like you you're you got to focus on the fire and it's hard to find extra time to like rebuild that foundation. And in those in that moment of pure utter chaos, I knew that time was the biggest constraint and that I just needed more time to fix some of the systematic systemic foundational issues. So then I started auditing and analyzing kind of where are we wasting time? And, I, and in, in that process, I realized there were three buckets where we were really wasting time. One was how we communicated. It was by the time I answered 150 people's Slack messages, just pings and dings, it was like a third of the day is gone, you know, between email and that. Next, so I knew I needed a better way to not be distracted, to streamline it and reduce kind of all that noise. The second was what I call planning. I couldn't just click a button and know who's working on what, what's the status of this project, what's past due that I asked someone to do, what should I do today? Like that wasn't just, those are like basic things. It doesn't matter what industry or what your business looks like. Like you should be able to answer those basic questions and I couldn't. So I knew that I needed to figure that part out. And then the last bucket was what I call resources. And we were already pretty good at that. If I if I weren't, you know, with documenting processes and SOPs, we probably would have gone bankrupt. So this was kind of the initial aha moment for the framework I developed called CPR, Communicate, Plan, and Resource. And coincidentally, things started shifting really quickly once I started focusing on those. And I started getting back time that I could then go and fix problems. And simultaneously, people started reaching out, asking me to consult them, you know, people, Friends of friends started, you know, saying like, "Hey, Nick is up to some cool stuff. You should hire him." And I got to work with really cool companies like Ethereum or Tony Robbins or Poopery. And I started. It didn't. What I Poo-pourri. what was interesting <laughs> was it didn't matter if you were a poop spray company, a cryptocurrency company, a you know my company, whatever. Everyone had these three buckets. Everyone had the same problems, just transposed in different ways. And so being an entrepreneur, I started realizing, hey, the real opportunity here is the impact I'm making with teaching people about this efficiency stuff. And so I, I pivoted the company to being an operational efficiency co- training company. And I wrote a book about it, Come Up For Air, which is based on that CPR framework. And all the trainings now that we do is training on the best practices that I've developed on how and when to, to maximize these tools and coordinate it amongst your team. This is such a fantastic example of how entrepreneurship happens. So many times you see a founder start a company, initial success, all of the good feelings, all of the external affirmation, everything looks great, raising money, but behind the scenes, 
it's just hard. I mean, it's not unusual the story you tell. I've seen it myself. But what you do there is you take the experience, you identify really the pain point, which is something that a lot of other people share, and you attack a far bigger market. So it's a very, I mean, doing that is really hard because a lot of people would say, I don't want to do this again. Get me a job at a corporation. Like I, don't, I This is like super traumatic. I need okay. to go to Bali for six months, all that sort of stuff. But if you are able to really identify the suffering and then universalize it, it can be the beginning of a much bigger, more interesting idea. Now, I do want to, before we, we get into the lightning round questions, I do want to ask you to tell us one thing to start doing and one thing to stop doing when it comes to our proactivity in, in, in our workplaces. So one of the most, one of the easiest, most impactful things that we're teaching right now at Leverage, and it sounds silly, but we have, we have our methodology on how to use email properly and get to inbox zero. Because look, you might be listening right now and some of these tools that we've thrown out, Notion, Asana, et cetera, like you may or may not have ever heard of them, your team might not be using them, but you for sure are using Outlook or Gmail, maybe Apple Mail or Superhuman or something, but um, you're using most likely Outlook or Gmail. So if you just learn the tips and tricks on how to get a grip on that, you could save half a day a week, literally, we're saying. Um, and I, we've worked with people with hundreds of thousands of emails, and within a few hours, we get them down to zero, and we teach them the right way of thinking about it, how email is just an external to-do list that other people can add to. And we have a yeah, framework say that called again. That is, Reply. That, that, just repeat that. That is somebody's to-do list for you. Yeah. It is so important. I, I, when I heard that for the first time, it changed everything for me. Okay, keep yeah, going. It's, it's an external to-do list that other people can add to. There's three things that you could do with every email. You can either reply to it, archive it, or defer. There's some tips and tricks and settings that, that you have to know. There's things around search and folders. But this isn't rocket science, and it's such a commonly used tool that you're doing yourself a disservice by not learning how to use that tool properly. You know, it's... It's pretty much common sense. If like if you're gonna do something, if you're gonna be in some program software doing some activity for I don't know, like people are spending something 10, 20, 30 hours a week in email. So it's kind of crazy that you don't spend a few hours to learn actually how to use this tool properly. You know, another thing that you could do that is more mindset that doesn't require learning anything technical is being aware that time isn't linear. And not every hour is worth the same. So we're talking a lot about time savings, but there's also time optimization. So I'll give myself as an example. I'm a morning person. Are you a morning person? Like no. when's your brain at full horsepower? Six o'clock. Six o'clock. All, right. All right. So great. So we have different, but it's important that you know that, right? So for me, um, my brain is at full horsepower. Actually, you're getting the full horsepower right now. You know, I can it's tell. 10 a.m. It's feeling it right yeah. now. <laughs> well, uh, you know, subject to a good night's sleep and like a workout mm -hmm. and everything. But like if I have a good night's sleep and say I wake up at six and I do kind of a morning routine and then I go to the gym and maybe I meditate if I want to. And then I have like my morning coffee. Like my brain's at full horsepower. Like what I can achieve in that next hour could be 10 times more than after 15 Zoom calls and I'm tired and, and fatigued, right? And so let's just say you're listening. Say you, you value your time at $100 an hour. It's not that every time slot's worth $100 an hour. You know, that if you're like me and you're a morning person, maybe it's $500 an hour in that scenario versus, you know, Friday at six o'clock and you've had 100 Zoom calls for the week and now you're in the back of an Uber with no Wi-Fi, no computer, your time is worth far less. Maybe it's worth $15 an hour in that time slot. And so acknowledging, you know, looking at, thinking about your calendar like it's a heat map and like different time slots have different values and optimizing your schedule around those time slots. And also acknowledging too, a, a huge thing is meetings are super inefficient. 
oftentimes things are happening on meetings that should happen asynchronously. So doing time shifts and being able to cut you know, an hour long meeting at 9 a.m. on a Monday to maybe 30 minutes. And then that the, the what you would normally cover in those 30 minutes, have someone record a video and send it to you. And now you can watch that video when you're in the back of that Uber. And now you're repurposing low value time and doing something useful for it with it. That's not rocket science. Everyone listening right now can do it. And that yeah. could that could be worth millions of dollars to your company. It's such a good point, and it is true. I, I, I don't do a lot of meetings anymore, and when I do sit in a meeting, what, like you know, I go to some meeting for a nonprofit I'm involved in, or whatever the heck it is, or I'm, I have a client. I'm in these. I'm like, how do these people do this all day long? Because you know, the corporate types, they're in meetings. Those of you who are listening, you know what I'm saying. You're like, you're starting out at eight thirty, and you're going to five thirty. It's like back to back to back to. And I don't even know how you make it through a day. Cause like that you, then every, and by the way, nobody's paying attention. Everybody's on zoom. They're all like reading, you know, TMZ.com. So it is in the age of zoom and people being checked out and work from home. Like it's even less sensible. FOMO. FOMO. All right. So Nick, it is time to move on to the lightning round because you know, you're an optimizer type of guy. So I expect you to be quite sharp here. I got four questions for you. Quick answers, um, and uh, let's see what you have ah, to say. All right. all right, you ready? Okay, good, good, good. Number one, tell me a favorite quote. Uh, David Allen has a good one I, re I recite a lot, which is, your brain is for having ideas, not holding ideas. Oh, I like that. All right, former guest of the show. Number two, name one book besides your own that every FOMO sapiens should read. I'm listening to one right now. Mm -hmm. And it's called Algorithms to Live By by Brian Christian and Tom Griffiths. I'm really enjoying this book. Okay. Number three, one piece of advice you would give to your, for, to your younger self. Mm. You know, when I was younger, I was so focused purely on math and I became kind of like an expert at like, I tried being the best at like a niche, which I think was important, but I think I- Fractals? I, Just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'm an expert at fractals. Um, <laughs> I wish I would have read more and kind of broadened my my education. I've been doing that, you know, in my in my 30s. I started doing that more, and, mm -hmm. and you know, especially if you want to be an entrepreneur, you have to be more well rounded. But I think that that's something I got so I got so deep into a certain, like uh, some niches in math and financial engineering that I, I, I wish I would have done a little bit more you know, skill broadening. Well, I'm glad you did because you wouldn't be on the show if you were just a niche guy. We wouldn't have you with the fractals. There's nothing to talk about. Finally, <laughs> number four, what's your most important memory? Hmm. Ooh, I guess it matters how you define important, but mm -hmm. I would say like a positive memory. I, I, I did a f master's in financial engineering. I, the whole time I was there, I was like, why the hell did they accept me into this program? I felt like I was the dumbest person there. I was 10 years younger than the average. And like all these people were like PhDs in nuclear physics. And I'm like this young kid, like why, why did you accept me? And I worked my ass off in that program. And they had a competition for like who wrote the best master's thesis. And so during graduation, they announced kind of who won this prize. And my family was there and like, I, I was lucky and got, got that prize. And like, I just remember seeing the, fa the face of my parents, how proud they were that, that I did. And I was, I get hard on myself. I don't usually get you know, proud of something I did, but like I worked so hard in that program thinking like at any point they're gonna figure out that they need to kick me out of this thing. That, um, that was like a big moment for me. What was the title of this uh, thesis? Ooh, stock predictability in liquid and illiquid stocks. So I was basically, I built a model. I compared two different mathematical techniques on predicting the next tick of a stock. That's cool. Not a sexy title. You've really improved in the way you title things. Hot, hot I'm topic, tell you huh? that. <laughs> yeah, no, I listen, I gotta tell you, what, what, what's interesting by the way, Nick, is, is we started this interview with you telling a story about you receiving an award that made you realize, oh, I can do this thing. And we end with it with a similar story, 
which is very interesting because I think so many of us, and, and I, I'm the same way, like so many of us, we work really hard and we we're hard on ourselves. And then one day, you know, all along, everybody's like, wow, what a great job. But we don't necessarily give ourselves the credit. Yeah. And then one day we get that thing and we're like, oh, so it's something to think about as we, you know, because at some point what's weird as an adult, and I'm sure you've noticed this is like as an adult, like there aren't that many prizes anymore. Like the, it's different. And so like I found it, I'm always like, I just want to win a prize, you know? Well, I think also, and tell me if this is, is you, but I think when you're a high achiever and you have like high expectations that you tend to celebrate less things that most people would celebrate. Cause it's kind of mm. like, you know, oh, what I did, I did the job that I set out to do. Like, yeah, oh, exactly. I shouldn't, like, I shouldn't get a trophy for to it. Do. Yeah, it's true. Well, you know yeah. what? I'm celebrating you today. And if people want to find out more about your work, they can read your book, which is called Come Up For Air. Much better title than your thesis. They can check out your <laughs> podcast, which is called The Optimized Podcast. And they can hire you or do your workshops. And you can find out more over there at getleverage.com. Yeah. For the book and podcast, for the book, we have a bunch of bonus resources that okay. couldn't fit into the book. So at comeupforair.com. If you go there, you can find information about the book and and all the bonus resources. And then podcast, theoptimizedpodcast.com is where you can see all the, the episodes. Perfect. All right, Nick Sonnenberg, author of Comp for Air and many other things. Thank you for being here. Thanks for having me. FOMO. If you like today's show, please be sure to rate it and recommend it to your friends. And as always, you can find me on Instagram at Patrick J. McGinnis, on Twitter at PJ McGinnis, and on the web at FOMOSapiens.com or PatrickMcGinnis.com, where you can get all kinds of free resources to live a more decisive and entrepreneurial life. FOMO Sapiens is recorded in New York City. Theme music is by Mike McGinnis, and editing and post-production is by Josh Elstro. If you like today's show, please be sure to rate it and recommend it to your friends. And as always, you can find me at FOMOSapiens.com and at PatrickMcGinnis.com. To advertise on FOMO Sapiens, reach out to contact at FOMOSapiens.com.